to bounce around a little bit, and I'm always in awe. I love uh, facilitating workshops like this because I get to learn so much from you all. There's so much knowledge sitting at the tables around this room and experience with cooperatives, so I'm really excited. Um, I am curious, I got to hear a few things being said, and I was just curious, not everybody, but just really succinctly, if you want to throw out a couple of things, it could be your own reason for being here, or maybe you heard a theme at your table, like there were several people uh, here for a similar sort of reason, and this just helps me so I can try to hit on the things that you're here for and make sure I meet your expectations. So one I heard was that a few people have a specific idea for a co-op they want to start. So I'm going to throw that one on the list. I'm starting a business is the co-op structure for me and why do co-ops fail? Other motivations for being here today? I can tell you about some of those. <laughs> Hopefully you like what I say today because I'm one of them. <laughs> We'll get into laws and accounting rules today, um, but I'll touch on it. Anything we're really missing? Like you're looking at this going, no, that's not me. Are these for profit uh, co ops or non profit co ops? We'll touch on that too. It depends. I'm just curious by a show of hands. Oh, go ahead. Is there another option besides for profit or non profit, not for profit? Yes. Yes, there is, and I will definitely talk about it. <laughs> All right. I'm curious just by a show of hands um, how many of you maybe have an idea for a co op? And how many of you are wondering, is the co-op structure right for me, or right for an idea, or right in my community? Right. Um, curious about why co-ops fail? Okay. Are resources available? Right. So these are all these all seem to be equally ranked. Uh, laws and accounting rules. <laughs> I, I saw a few hands. I saw a few hands. And then this whole for-profit, not-profit. Is there some other way? Can we talk about this in different language? I see a few hands there. This is featured prominently in the presentation, so we'll, uh, we'll get there. Great. Um, I want to spend a few more minutes conversing at your table. So here is your next prompt. Oh, actually, sorry. I'll answer that question for, for myself. Why am I here? I'm here um, because I'm a member of a number of cooperatives. I'm a big believer in cooperatives. The more I learn about them, the more I get excited about them. Um, it's also what I do in my my day job, I wear several hats, but one of them is cooperative development specialist. And what do I want to get out of it? I want to connect with people, and especially people who have ideas for cooperatives, because that's what I do. I, I work with those people and I support them. So I'm always uh, connecting with people like you uh, to build projects. Yes? We're getting there. We're getting there. Don't worry. I'll put it on the list. So, but before I start my Co-ops 101 section, I have, I have two more questions for you all to discuss. And the first one is, what are you doing in your life that's mutually supportive? So I will give you an example to get you thinking. This is from my own life. I think I mentioned that we live in Ronan. It's about an hour north of here in the Mission Valley. Um, Ronan itself is about 1,900 people. We live nine miles outside of town, and my parents live a mile down the road. So. When we come to Missoula, we do grocery shopping for everybody, right? To save, to save on trips, and even just trips into town, into Rodan or to Polson, 
you know, if I'm, gonna be, if I'm in the store, I call my parents and say, do you need anything while I'm in town? Um, and that's, a, that's something that we do that's mutually supportive, that helps us all meet our needs um, and save on some resources. So what do you do in your life that's mutually supportive? You're, you're helping out friends, family, community, um, so that you can all meet your needs. Driving on the right side of the road, oh. okay, right? <laughs> Obeying traffic laws. Anybody hear something at their table that they thought was really, really yes, lovely? Building a trail. Yes. Yeah, the or arts organization and trail building. Today, I heard teaching children about about food and farming. Neighbors helping neighbors. And I also, as I walked around, I heard several of you commenting, and I think. You can see sort of the point of this question, which is that there are many ways in which humans cooperate, um, and that there, there. Are, if you look at Eleanor Ostrom's research, which I don't have time to get into today, but it sort of uh, her thesis was that humans are have a propensity towards cooperation more so than competition. Um, and I, I heard several of you making the point that really most of what we do is in our lives is really built in some way on cooperation, and there's so there is this whole spectrum. And I always like to start by acknowledging that there's a great history of cooperation and that people have been organizing and cooperating around the world throughout history. They may use different language and the arrangements might look a little different. I'm gonna to talk today about some more formalized ways of cooperating with some specific legal definitions. Then here's my last question for you before we dive into Co-ops 101. And I realize I could be opening a can of worms here, but I would like you to just briefly go around and identify a need or a problem in your community. And here's how I'd like you to narrow it down. I want it to be one that you have a personal stake in. And I know we all have a personal stake in climate change, um, but here is my personal example. I have a three-year-old, also have a full-time job in an 80-acre farm. I cannot find affordable childcare, except for us to do it ourselves, or to depend on family. So, Make it something that's relatively concrete and that you have, you really have a personal stake in. I love it. Such an action-oriented group. By the end, I was hearing the solutions also um, and the ideas. But I'm curious for now to hear some of the needs that, that came out in your conversations. Sense of community. Local healthy food. Did I hear education? Yes. Transportation. Anything else you'd like to add to the list right now? Financial. Would you like to say more about that? People who came together to cooperate. And what's important about them, a lot of people look at them as the, the birth of the modern cooperative movement. Lots of people were cooperating before that. Unfortunately, we've lost a lot of that history. The Rochdale Pioneers were a group of people who cooperated, and we haven't lost their history because of oppression, we haven't lost their history because it was simply forgotten um, or got lost in some way. And that has happened to the history of cooperation of many communities. And so I'd like to really draw that, make that point, um, because this was a group of white European men um, who got together and did some great things. They spelled out some principles that have evolved into this international statement on the cooperative identity. So you can read the definition there. It's, it's really a mouthful. A cooperative, cooperative is an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise. I'm going to get into some examples soon. If you're like me, those will help a lot more than that definition does. Um, but I'd like to point out that co-ops can be created to exchange different types of value, not just money. Right? So there's babysitting cooperatives to meet that child care need. People aren't exchanging money necessarily, they might be exchanging their time. So there are different types of value that can be exchanged. Cooperatives tend to speak to people across the political spectrum. And I think a big part of that is if you look at this list of values, that starts out with self-help and self-responsibility, moves through democracy, which we all at least say we value, equality, equity, and solidarity. And you can probably place yourself along that spectrum of what's most important to you, and you might be able to recognize other people in your life from other parts of the political spectrum and what would resonate with them. Um, but that self-help 
and self-responsibility piece is really key to cooperatives. I think it's a key to their appeal, and then the fact that they can be a tool for social justice, equity, and solidarity. I'm just gonna blaze through these principles really quickly. Um, voluntary and open membership doesn't actually mean that a cooperative has to take everyone. Right? If you're an agricultural marketing cooperative, you don't have to take every single farmer, especially if you can't sell their products. Right? You can say, no, actually, we only have this much market. Um, but you can't discriminate on the basis of you know, any of the things that are listed there. Same thing in a worker-owned cooperative. There's a, usually a dating period. You might work there for a while to see if it's a good fit for you and for the other workers. Now, they can't discriminate you against you for your gender, or your ethnicity, or any religion, any of those factors. Um, but it still can you know, make sure it's a good fit for everyone. Democratic member control, which we've already touched on, this is that one member, one vote. Members have a say over the major issues. They also elect the board that governs the cooperative. This is really central to cooperatives. Um, and I think I also mentioned that member economic participation. This is both in putting forward at least some of the capital that it takes to fund the cooperative, and then participating, doing business. If it's a grocery store, shopping there. Right, if you're a farmer, selling your goods to the cooperative. Um, and participation is really what makes cooperatives work. Um, if you flip the page over, autonomy and independence. Uh, a big piece of this is that uh, cooperatives aren't meant to be run by the government or other outside organizations. They were really meant to run themselves. Education, you'll hear this later on too. Education, training, and information is an ongoing need of cooperatives. And um, actually, it was interesting that Miguel brought up Paulo Freire and popular education. A lot of cooperatives use the, the, the tools of popular education. I'm not doing that particularly well today, but they use them. And a lot of cooperatives actually start as study groups. They start with people learning together, and then comes the cooperative. You can do it the other way around too, you can have the idea for the cooperative, and then you have to do a lot of education piece as well. Um, uh, a Catholic priest um, who started a lot of some amazing cooperatives in Spain once said that he wasn't really sure if this was an economic movement using the tools of education, or an education movement using the tools of economics. Um, I'd say it's probably both. So the last two principles, cooperation among cooperatives. Uh, this takes a lot of different forms, um, but the idea is that cooperatives support each other and try to form a cooperative economy. And so sometimes that means doing business with other cooperatives. So in the co-op grocery world, there's a great campaign called P6, which stands for Principle 6, Cooperation Among Cooperatives. And it's a way, um, in P6, they have little cards that they put on the products and they say small, local, and cooperative. And so the producer has to be two out of those three things. They could be a, a small local producer, or they could be small producers from far away, but they're part of a cooperative. And so it's a way that co-op grocery stores are um, promoting their principles and supporting other cooperatives and small producers. Uh, there's also, in co-op, cooperation among cooperatives, uh, there's a piece here where co-ops help start other co-ops, they help finance other co-ops, because the financing piece is hard for cooperatives. And they also sometimes form co-op organizations. So co-ops can form co-ops of themselves. I'll talk about this a little, bit, a little bit more later. They're called federations. And so co-ops can actually get together and, and work together. And concern for community um, is one of those principles as well. And you can see when you, know, you have something like concern for community on the list, these are the principles that define what a cooperative is more than anything else. And they really set cooperatives apart from other businesses or even other types of organizations. So before I go to my next slide, I want to ask you, if you are a co-op owner or member, stand up. If you're a member or owner of a cooperative, stand up. Okay, great. So I think I have six, seven people standing? Is that about right? Okay. Seven and a half? Yeah. Seven and a half people. Okay, great. All right. Take a moment. Please don't shout an answer out yet. Take a moment. I want you to look at this slide. These are all businesses that do business in Missoula. They may or may not be local, but they do business here. I'm curious, in a, in a moment, I'm gonna give you all a chance to think about this. I'm curious to identify which ones are cooperatives. We have Missoula Federal Credit Union, Blackfoot, Triple Divide, Seeds, Ace Hardware, and REI. REI. Okay, credit union. should we go through them all? Who thinks that the credit union is? Okay, I see some hands. Blackfoot. I see a few hands. <coughs> Triple divide. 
Also a few hands. Ace Hardware. Couple hands. REI. Lots of hands. They're all cooperatives. Sorry, it was a trick question. So, credit unions are in fact cooperatives. Um, I couldn't really find anything that Missoula Federal Credit Union really had cooperative next to their name, but you'll notice the new ad campaign that they've been running recently, and belong, and they use images of community gardens, and that word about belonging. And that, I think that's sort of their way of saying, hey, come be a part of a cooperative. Don't just do business with us, and you actually belong to us. And I did, I was in one of their branches yesterday, and I picked up a brochure that actually had the word cooperative on it. Um, They're all cooperatives. Mm -hmm. They may now they may operate more or less like a cooperative. One issue that really big established cooperatives have is that people don't participate. I mean, they participate in the extent of they they bank there, but they don't go to the annual meeting. I'm terrible. I'm, I'm a lifelong member of credit union. I've never been to one of their annual meetings. I saw the one this year. And I was like, I should really get down there to go and vote, but I didn't. Blackfoot Telecommunications, same thing. Cooperative, uh, owned by the users of those services. Lots of rural utilities, I'll say more about this in a minute, but lots of rural utilities in the US, US are cooperatives. Triple Divide Organic Seed Cooperative, I had to edit their logo because all of their stuff says they're a co-op, so I had to edit it for that last slide. They're owned by the farmers, right? So those farmers run that cooperative, make those decisions. Ace Hardware is an interesting one. It's a retail cooperative, but it's not like your co-op grocery where the consumers own it. The stores own the cooperative. So the individual Ace Hardwares are locally owned, and there are purchasing cooperatives. So all the Ace Hardware stores together own the cooperative, and they buy, they do, they do bulk purchasing that way. It's how they get their economies of scale, which we can argue about the value of economies of scale, but in order for them to compete in the economy now, they need that. Right, this is how they compete against Lowe's and um, Home Depot and some of those places with locally owned stores. They purchase goods together so they can get them for that lower price, helps with their profits, or their surplus, as we should think of it perhaps, and they do their advertising and branding together. And then REI, I really love it, about a year and a half ago, they, they had been using this logo and they said, you know what, we owe it to the co-op community to put it back in our name. When you go and you become a member at REI, you're actually becoming an owner of that co-op. And when you get that dividend at the end of the year, it's not just a nice refund. That's actually REI returning its surplus to its member owners. Yes? What does REI stand for? Recreational Equipment Incorporated? It says so. Yeah, when I, I, when I was in the credit union yesterday, I did see a young guy wearing a hoodie that said the original outdoor cooperative, REI. Um, so they, they're embracing that. I, and I think it's a maybe also a little reflection of the, the economic and cultural moment that we're in, that they have realized that they should embrace this. Um, so I'm just curious, now who would say that you're a member owner of a cooperative? They would stand up, oh, hey, congratulations. <laughs> so, Cooperatives are a really well-kept secret in our economy. Sorry, I'm just going to do a quick time check to see how I'm doing. Oh, then that's okay. I, I always have sort of more than I can possibly jam in, so we're going to keep moving here. So just another point I want to make here is that cooperatives really do exist across all sorts of sectors and industries. And then there's also uh, quite a bit of variation in who in the role, in who owns that cooperative. So just right up here, you can see, right, we have an agricultural cooperative, Triple Divide, that's owned by the producers. Um, we have REI, which is owned by the consumers. We have Ace Hardware, which is actually, the cooperative is owned by businesses, right? Missoula Federal Credit Union and Blackfoot, the users of those services. One thing that I like to point out, I don't have any worker, I'll get to worker co-ops in a minute, um, the difference between like an ag, an ag producer co-op and a worker co-op, right? You can have like a coffee roaster that's a worker-owned co-op, so the people who work there own it. The difference between that and an ag producer co-op is that in the ag producer co-op, it's also the people who are making the goods, right? If that producer co-op sells seeds, it's the people who make grow those seeds that own the co-op, but they all have their own individual businesses. Right at that worker co-op, the coffee roasters, it's one business that they own together. And in a producer co-op, there's a bunch of separate farm businesses or art, artisan businesses or whatever it might be that produce the goods, 
um, and then they own that club together to benefit their individual bi businesses. So there's a, there's a little bit of a distinction there if you're thinking about structuring a cooperative. Something to think about. Yeah, Katie. Where does like, the term collective fit into this mix? Anywhere? Um, Katie asked, where does the term collective fit into this mix? I would say that collective could be a Venn diagram with cooperative, where I think of collectives as being about the way they manage the business. And so you could have a cooperative that uses a collective management approach or not. I think, and I'm not an expert in collectives, but I think you could have a collective that operates much like a cooperative, but you could also have one that does not necessarily. Um, maybe doesn't follow those principles, you know, maybe doesn't share surpluses, or you know, maybe there's collective management but it's not fully democratic. <coughs> Oh, I would just like to note that October is National Cooperative Month, so Blackfoot Telecommunications was doing a number of events. This was the one place I could find where Missoula Federal Credit Union actually referred to them as a cooperative. Credit unions are not-for-profit financial cooperatives. That means we are simply people helping people. So, I've already talked about Triple Divide a little bit. This is the one place where I'll plug a little bit of the work that our organization does. As I've said, we've, well, my, my uh, co-worker Jan Tusik has been, many of you know her, um, she's been very involved in local food systems development in Montana for 20 plus years and is a producer herself. And a, a much of that food systems development work has happened through cooperatives because of the kind of power of this model. So we have Triple Divide Organic Seed Cooperative, which is a group of farmers who um, recognize the need to control the source of their seeds. They recognize this need for seeds that were adapted to organic systems and uh, northern climates. Um, and you know, some some of them had that like horrible moment where they went to order their seeds one winter, and their favorite variety wasn't there. And it was a political awakening moment where they understood right consolidation of power in our in our uh, economy, and that you know their seed company got bought by other some other seed company, and the seed variety disappeared. And they went, well, I better start growing my own seeds. Um, and this was a way for them to expand their markets as well. You know, we have a pretty robust local food system in Western Montana, and Farmers are looking for other market opportunities, and so this was a way to diversify. So I have a question. Yes. Uh, can you comment on the business model between a local cooperative and a national one? For example, REI is not local, where there are other local cooperatives. So what are the advantages from a business model point of view between local cooperative and non-local? The business model advantages? Yeah, I mean, who one would be more resilient, who mm -hmm. one would be more effective, what will bring more dividends to the constituencies, whatnot. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of debate, I think, within the cooperative community, um, and I don't know, sometimes that's maybe not framed as in terms of kind of local or national level cooperatives, so much as maybe just the size of the cooperative, just the sheer number of members. And there's definitely a debate about how, as a cooperative grows and as it ages, Right, you have that, that those founding members who really understand the kind of democratic principles, and how do you pass that on um, as you know as the ownership shifts over the time? There's definitely a question about um, are they less cooperatives? You know, are they still maybe a cooperative in name, but less so in their principles? I think that's a really reasonable question. Um, it's hard for me to say which is more resilient. I think that uh, there's maybe. Uh, ease of starting a more of a local oriented cooperative, but like I want to point out equal exchange. On one of my next slides I have equal exchange represented. They're actually a worker owned cooperative, right? They sell coffee, tea, chocolate, some other products. They work with agricultural cooperatives throughout the world. Um, they're very resilient. If you look at the, so they return their surplus, right, to their member owners. And if I recently just saw a chart, um, they pretty much returned 5% a year, and they did it straight through the recession of 2008. It just really did not vary. And so, you know, they're, they are quite large and quite resilient. So I don't know if I have a, a really clear answer to that. Let me keep thinking on it. If I can think of anything else, I'll, I'll share it. Um, I like to point out Montana Poultry Growers Cooperative because this is a cooperative that has evolved over time. And actually, if you're interested in the story, I'll just mention that uh, Katie Demetz did some great research for us and published um, a really fabulous case study on the Poultry Growers Cooperative. It looks like this, and there's copies on the table back there. Um, 
for our organization. So if you're interested in what they do, you can read more about it. But this started out as a purchasing cooperative, right? So it was farmers who wanted, uh, needed more affordable, organic poultry feed. And so they formed a cooperative, they purchased in bulk, it reduces the cost for all of them. They've now evolved through a few iterations of some shared processing models to own a cooperative processing facility um, down in the Bitterroot really filled the gap for kind of local poultry processing and was a really interesting intersection of cooperative structure with the regulatory requirements. Um, as, as Katie can tell you, one of the tricks was that Montana law sort of only allows the one holder of that license to process in the facility. And they were able to make the argument to the Department of Livestock that, hey, if our cooperative holds it, any of our members should be able to process that facility. We're the one holder of that license. All of our members should be able to process there. So it was kind of a way for people to come together to do something together and fit it into that legal structure, that, those regulatory requirements. So I just wanted to throw out a few more examples of cooperatives. Um, you know, you see in the middle Organic Valley and Ocean Spray. Um, the biggest cooperatives in the country are old agricultural cooperatives, many of which are engaged in conventional agriculture. Uh, cooperatives are a pretty versatile tool. <laughs> Maybe not all applications are advancing uh, the interests of the folks in this room. I will just sort of acknowledge that um, fairly upfront. Um, but lots of agricultural cooperatives, worker-owned cooperatives, uh, I think are a, a growing area right now in the country. So like I said before, Equal Exchange sells coffee and tea. Equal Exchange is worker-owned. They then work with uh, cooperatives in the countries that they source coffee and tea and chocolate from. And what I love about Equal Exchange is, like, in good years, some of their farmers in Costa Rica and Nicaragua actually invest in Equal Exchange and help finance it, which also means then when Equal Exchange is a good year, I was telling you before, they return about 5% every year. Those farmers are getting a return from Equal Exchange doing well. They invest in Equal Exchange because they value the service they get from Equal Exchange, and then they get some extra return as well. Um, Equal Exchange and Organic Valley have also done amazing work in helping to finance co-ops. That's that cooperation among cooperatives work. When they go out to get a loan, they go to lenders who work with cooperatives because they're like, this is the kind of world we want to create. When we pay interest on our loans, we want that interest to go help other cooperatives. Um, most conventional banks don't like lending to cooperatives anyway. Um, but they, they recognize that where that profit from that loan is going is very different from where the the profit um, you know, from some of these cooperative friendly lenders is going. Arizmendi Bakery in uh, California is also an example. They started out as one worker owned bakery. They've now, with the success of that bakery, they've helped other cooperative bakeries form. So there's now I think seven of the worker owned bakeries and then they have one central support organization that helps them do the back end accounting and bookkeeping and all of those pieces. One thing I love about cooperatives is the human empowerment piece. Right? People learn how to run meetings, they learn governance, they learn to understand finance and business. And I've met all these people who started out like working in the co-op, grocery store, doing something, and now they're the bookkeeper because nobody wanted to do it. And they learned how. And so I love the education and empowerment piece. Um, Namaste Solar is a solar installation cooperative. It was founded by an individual. They then converted to a worker-owned cooperative. And what's cool is he stayed involved in the business. But now he's just one of the many decision makers. Um, there's a movement right now uh, towards these worker-owned cooperatives, as I was saying, and conversions. And the big splashy news headline is about the, the silver tsunami, right? Baby boomers are retiring and what's going to happen to their businesses. And it's, it turns out it's not just farming, where kids are not following their parents into the profession. It's like all types of jobs. Kids are not following their parents into the family business. Well, what are they going to do? They don't have a succession plan. And so one of the answers that people are advocating is worker conversions. The reality is that in a lot of cases, it's not at a retirement moment. Those owners stay involved. They just realize like the business has grown beyond me. Or I never really wanted to run a company in the first place. I just like doing this thing. Now suddenly I'm running a company. And they convert to a worker cooperative and stay involved um, because of the value and the principles. And then I like to point out Stocksy and then Savvy is a cooperative I just learned about recently. Stocksy is uh, photographers. Um, who produce stock photographs. Worker-owned cooperative, website, all the money, you know, you would normally have to pay to purchase that stock photo, but a portion of those profits go to sort of whoever the broker is or whoever's selling them instead of to the artist. 
So in this case, the artists have maintained control, maintained control over how they're selling their photographs, and the profits are all going to them. And then um, I'll say more about, about Savvy in a minute. But this, these two kind of a little bit represent this movement towards platform cooperativism, which is using internet tools and website platforms. I still have, a, uh, I still have one of these. This is not really my area of, uh, of expertise. One thing that is totally not represented up here is housing cooperatives. I just want to mention that. That's a huge area. And financial services um, like the credit unions and then also insurance. There's a lot of insurance companies that are mutuals. So I want to say more about platform cooperatives right here in reference to Union Cab of Madison. They're a worker-owned cab company in Madison, Wisconsin. Wisconsin and Minnesota are sort of like a haven of cooperatives in the United States. Um, Worker-owned cab company, They've been, they have developed their own platform to compete with Uber and Lyft. And so the idea behind platform cooperativism, right, you look at the gig economy, which is something like a third of people in the United States are now making some or all of their income via the gig economy and via these online platforms, right? You, you drive for Uber, you know, you make a little money. This is what I'm talking about in the gig economy. And on the one hand, that can be cool, flexible work style. On the other hand, it can be very extractive and even abusive to its workers, right? And those workers are unprotected by the labor laws that would provide minimum wage and job benefits. So the idea of platform cooperativism, and there are some really amazing young people working on this who are the tech savvy and are not daunted by raising huge amounts of capital, um, who are trying to build these platforms that would be cooperatively owned. So you provide that same level of service to your customers, right? Because customers are now used to the convenience of Airbnb, the convenience of Uber, Lyft, all of these services, but they would be democratically governed and those profits or surpluses, however you want to think about them, go back to the workers, right? The platforms that we have now are not democratically governed, right? The things coming out of Silicon Valley, far from democratically governed, far from transparent, um, and you know, that surplus is being extracted to the investors instead of back to the workers. So Union Cab has developed their own platform to compete with Uber and Lyft. Works really well for the folks who live in Madison, who know Union Cab and want to support a cooperative. Doesn't work as well with the student population that's transient, right? They live somewhere else. Uber works in the city they come from. Uber works in Madison. So, you know, they're trying to figure out how to compete with that. And I also like to point out Isthmus Engineering and Manufacturing, which is also in Madison, just again to drive home this point of cooperatives can exist in all sectors of industry. Um, they are worker-owned. Engineering and manufacturing, when I got to tour their plant, they were making parts for Tesla's cars. I mean, these are some, this is a very high-tech operation, worker-owned cooperative. So this is Savvy, which I mentioned a minute ago. This, I am so fascinated by this cooperative. It was founded by two people who have chronic illnesses. And the woman who I heard speak had been diagnosed as a child with a chronic illness. And she grew up her entire life um, participating in studies and being asked questions. And... Partly that was because big pharmacy companies were trying to sort of figure out how to get patients to adhere to their, their treatment regimes, right? So they questioned them. And one of the things she noticed was that that was an extractive relationship, right? She was volunteering all of this data about herself, all this information about herself, and so that they could profit. And she also noticed that a lot of times in these studies, the patient voice was missing. So a lot of times the data actually was being collected from the doctors, not directly from the patients. And so she went and got, I think, two PhDs. And her goal was to really figure out how to elevate the voice of the patient and to make sure that they actually get some value back because they're offering up very valuable information that's generating profit for these companies. And how do they get rewarded for that? And so she's formed uh, this cooperative called Savvy. And the, the pitch is Patients Are Savvy. Um, and the idea is that it's a place where companies can come who want to do these kinds of studies and work with patients and get feedback. And they can set up all different kinds of studies, um, but it is a cooperative. So those patients have kind of a say over how everything operates, and they're actually getting compensated back through it. So if this sounds interesting to you, I encourage you. She's got some super cute um, videos that do a brilliant job of explaining cooperatives using puppets. Um, so look up Savvy Co-op uh, and, and check out the puppets. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the rural, the rural utilities, and particularly the rural electric cooperatives and the role that they've played in US history. So if you look at this map, I can't seem to get a straight answer on, on exactly how much of the US is served by an, uh, an electric cooperative, but it's somewhere between like 60 and 80% of the US landmass 
not the population, but the land mass, gets its electricity from a cooperative. That's all the green area you see there. Imagine if that was dark. And what those cooperatives provided, I'm, I'm looking at the clock. I'm not going to have time to get into the history part today, so I apologize if you were excited about that. But um, if you look at the history of the rural electrics, when they started, people not only got access to electricity, they got access to time. A lot of the times, the first thing that a family purchased, a rural family purchased when they got electricity, was a washing machine. That gave them access to time, and it gave them access to literacy. When the rural part of the United States got electrified, literacy rates went up because people had access to education, books, night school, they could study. Um, and so that made a huge shift. And I'll just, I can't do the whole history present part of the presentation today, but I'll just throw out there that the, ele the rural electrics were formed because the investor owned utilities wouldn't serve this part of the country. They said not profitable enough. In the urban areas, 90% of people had electricity for years, and the rural areas were underserved. The government went to them, this was in the 30s, the government went to them and said, here, here's money. And they said no, and they turned it down. And a few rural communities had started experimenting with forming cooperatives, and FDR's administration said, okay, we have a tool here. And they started promoting cooperatives and financing them. They were offering loans on good terms to help finance the start of these electric cooperatives. And within 10 years, 90% of rural America had electricity. It was a very efficient way to get this big project done and meet the needs of these people. Um, and this is starting to happen now. A lot of the electric cooperatives are looking at broadband because that's now the utility uh, where rural people are underserved. And so the rural electrics are starting to look at it. And this is, this is a different variation on your question before of the local versus kind of national. And I was saying that a lot of times age seems to matter. I will say some of these rural electric utilities are a little set in their ways. Um, maybe aren't pushing the kind of social justice side of the cooperative movement. They're, they have become entrenched power themselves, um, but people are starting to organize again and people are starting to agitate and there are people out there educating people, kind of like earlier today when I said who's a member of a co-op and seven people stood up and then I showed you and then most of you raised your hands afterwards. They're going out and educating people and saying, did you know you're a member of a cooperative? Did you know you can vote, right? Did you know that you can vote that board out? Those guys who've been serving on the board for 30 years and get an, you know, actually get a paycheck from your rural electric cooperative. Um, and so some of these cooperatives, and there's a lot of structural reasons uh, why some electric cooperatives are stuck in their ways, um, but some of them are really innovating around renewable energy. Um, and that, that's a whole, whole lengthy conversation we could have. They also help build local economies. This comes from the co-op grocery sector. And a lot of it is the, this research, um, people are trying to do more of this research now, uh, but there's just not a lot of it out there yet. Um, but if you look at co-op grocery stores, they spend more of their revenues locally, they source more of their products locally. Uh, the multiplier effect, right, when you spend a dollar at that co-op, how much of it turns over in the local economy is higher for a co-op compared to another grocery store. Um, they create more jobs for the same amount of revenue or the same amount of sales. Um, a conventional grocery store has 5.8 jobs for every million dollars in sales. A food co-op has 9.3 jobs. And more of those jobs are full-time and more of those jobs provide benefits to employees. And, you know, just like earlier we sort of realized that co-ops were hidden in plain sight for many of us. Just some, just some numbers. If you look uh, across the world, there are 2.6 million cooperatives. If you put them all together, they'd be the world's fifth largest economy. Um, there's about 30,000 in the U.S. and actually I need to change the slide. I just, most business schools do not teach cooperative economics or cooperative business models. You have to find them in the ag economy departments, right, in ag schools. And so at the University of Wisconsin there's an ag economist who's been trying to, trying to figure out how many co-ops there are in the United States uh, because we don't really have a good data set that shows that. That's going to change because this year the, the business census that went out actually asked, are you a cooperative? gave a definition and then said, are you a cooperative? Because they've just been trying to figure it out. They've been taking these gigantic data sets of all the businesses in the US and trying to count how many were cooperatives. And it wasn't working very well. This number is actually probably much larger. I saw uh, Brent Huth, the economist, present a couple weeks ago. They're now estimating that it's actually closer to 65,000. Um, and that wasn't because of the of growth in cooperatives. It's because they got better at counting them and finding them. 
Um, and there's more than 200 co-ops in Montana. I work at an economic development organization, so I always have to kind of throw in these numbers that those 200 co-ops uh, produce a billion dollars in revenue and employ 3,500 people. So significant economic impacts, if that's the language you speak. I think it was more than one in three people in this room who hold membership in a co-op. And I just always like to point out that more Americans are um, owners of co-ops than hold shares in the stock market. So if you want to talk about models that are, oh, I'm being told to move over so that I'm in view of the camera. If you want to talk about economic models that are serving the majority of Americans, we can talk about, we should be talking about cooperatives. So there's a really, most of the cooperatives in the United States have been in the area of financial services, uh, housing, some retail, and agriculture. There's a long history of agricultural cooperatives, like I was saying before. Um, mo most of the biggest cooperatives in the U.S. Um, are either rural, utilities, or agricultural cooperatives. And that's kind of reflected, so this is, I'll touch on some of the resources that are out there. A lot of the resources come through the USDA. Um, and serve rural communities because that's been most of the history in the United States is that cooperatives meet the needs of rural communities. The investors have the urban areas covered, or so we thought, uh, and the rural communities need cooperatives. Now it's actually turning out that urban areas need cooperatives too and that many urban communities are very underserved by our mainstream economy. Uh, but if you look at at least where our federal government has invested resources, it's mostly rural communities. My job is, pa uh, maybe I shouldn't say that publicly, my job is supported um, through a federal program, USDA Rural Development, the Rural Cooperative Development Program. I'll just mention that we, we don't have a farm bill passed and that that program is housed in the farm bill. Um, civic engagement, cooperatives are great for building that. How about we say that? How about we just leave that there? Um, there was a really great piece of legislation passed recently, though there's been a lack of resources for urban cooperative development. Less of an issue in Montana, but if you live in Missoula, Great Falls, or Billings, that's an issue for you, um, because there's sort of less resources for cooperative development in those areas, and after the next census, Bozeman will be added to that list, um, because of the population growth in Bozeman. Those are kind of our, the way USDA looks at it, those are our urban areas. Um, so technically, in my position, I can come give a presentation in Missoula, but I'm not really supposed to work with cooperatives in Missoula, um, unless they're an agricultural cooperative and all their owners reside in rural areas. So, um, but I'm happy to chat with all of you today. And then I also want to mention a new piece of legislation that just passed. It's kind of amazing. It is one of those moments where I'm like, something really great just happened. Uh, the Main Street Employee Ownership Act passed. And this, uh, this piece of legislation directs the SBA, the Small Business Administration, and the SBDCs, the Small Business Development Centers, to help exiting owners explore employee ownership options, including worker cooperatives. So again, I mentioned before, people moving towards retirement, what's their succession plan? SBA and the SBDC have now been told you need to help them explore employee ownership, which can take a few different forms, and one is a worker cooperative. And that's an amazing recognition of the value of employee ownership. Um, again, I heard Miguel mention in his presentation the uh, ownership of the means of production. And cooperatives really recognize the importance of ownership. Who owns it? Um, I didn't actually really get into the USDA definition of a cooperative. It's a little narrower than this international statement I told you. But basically, they define it as uh, user-owned, user-controlled, and, and, or member-owned, member member-controlled, member-benefit. You'll notice some of those things about the voluntary membership, those aren't in there. <laughs> um, but basically, they look at a cooperative as, you know, it has to be used and owned by the people who benefit. So they even recognize that importance of ownership. Um, I don't really have time to get into it at length, but along with democratic governance, I think the question of ownership is a key defining feature of cooperatives and a key of what makes them important is that people actually have an ownership stake. So the other thing that this piece of legislation does that's exciting is that it directs the SBA to make their loans available to cooperatives. So I mentioned before, and it's, again, it's, this is a whole workshop of its own, is sort of financing and equity around cooperatives, um, but it is hard for cooperatives to get loans. There's some USDA programs that are available for cooperatives, but now the SBA loans are going to be available for cooperatives as well, which is really quite exciting. All right. That brings us to the end of the Co-Ops 101 section. Oh, we're almost to the end, sorry. I'm gonna fly through this, we're totally skipping history. I'm gonna fly through really quickly the how-to development piece, and then 
I'm sorry, we didn't leave very much time for the co-op lab part, so we'll start that now, and then I, I'm here through the weekend to continue talking to you individually about your ideas. So this is, all right, I'm gonna keep holding the microphone. This is gonna be a little hard for me to do with the microphone and the marker all at once. Yeah, I can help you. You like. Yeah, I'll just thank you, Janet. So, how to, how to start a cooperative, the first stages of cooperative development. It starts with people. Right, that's like the first question, right? When somebody comes up to me and says, I have an idea for cooperative, and I say, great, who else is involved? Because you need more than one person, you need at least two. Also, an idea. Sometimes the idea comes first, and one person has the idea, and then they go recruit people. Sometimes a group of people have an idea, you're all sitting around talking about a problem, and you're like, hey, wait a second, we can do something here. So, it starts with people and an idea. Those people need to have some kind of shared need and shared vision, right? They've got to have some common, common ground between them, some things that they all need, and they all need to have an idea of where they're headed together. So, from there, usually they hold a couple of meetings, they talk about the idea, they figure out who's excited, and they form a steering committee. And that steering committee's job is to, is to hold the idea of this cooperative in trust for the future owners. They're going to do a lot of the work of getting that, that cooperative off the ground um, and sort of steering that ship until there is a cooperative. From here, you split into two pieces. And one, I'm going to change colors here, one is just standard business development. And this looks pretty much like other businesses. But what makes cooperatives different is that democratic association. It's how people work together. It's how you form the human organization that really is this business. I've heard people say that cooperatives are associations of people who produce businesses. The, ca the capital isn't king in this system, right? It's the people. The people get together and they produce a business. So I'll jump back over here to the business development side. You do some kind of feasibility study. You have to look at, you know, what are the markets? What are the costs of doing business? Do we produce enough of whatever it is that we want to produce? Um, what are the regulations that apply? I'm working with a group trying to start a cooperative brewery. Like, how is the state going to look at, you know, 300 people running an alcohol license together? Um, so there's this whole feasibility kind of piece that you look at. You then stop in the steering committee after they get their feasibility research done, they look at it and they go, is this still a good idea or not? And they might say, yeah, you know, we like the idea, but it's not going to work, and they stop. If they keep going, then they write a business plan. Right? So the feasibility study said, is this possible? Right? Is there a way to do it? And then the business plan is, this is the way we're going to do it. And this is pretty standard. I mean, there's a little different. Some, a few differences in the, the financial projections for a cooperative because they have some different capital sources, but it's pretty much a standard business plan. Um, and then, if they're still moving ahead from this, they incorporate. So they write bylaws, they write their articles of incorporation, they file with the Secretary of State, they send in their 20 bucks. Um, and again, this looks, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty today. If you want to start a cooperative, I'll help you with the nitty gritty. This looks a little different depending on the type of cooperative in Montana that they're forming. This process, the incorporation works a little differently. Simultaneously, you have all this stuff going on over here with the feasibility and the business plan and the incorporation. Simultaneously is a huge, I'll leave this up. I apologize for those of you who can't see it or read it very well. There's a huge education piece, and this education piece encompasses co-op education. What is a co-op? Dive way deeper into all those principles we talked about today. Dive way deeper into all of those possible structures. Um, it involves communication. How to be a good communicator. It involves group processes, right? How to run a good meeting. Um, it involves all of the, kind of all of the, well, all the democratic association pieces of working together. Right? How do we make decisions together? What are, besides majority vote, what are the other ways that groups can make decisions together? And how do we want to do that? So, and this takes ongoing education. You can imagine, especially when people are starting to form a business together, challenges come up. And it's, it, it is this just, I can't emphasize this enough, how much 
this has the education and the democratic association has to go hand in hand with that business development. Um, and it's really fun though, because you all get to grow as people. So, and then if all of this works and goes really well, you start your member drive. And this can look different. You know, if it's a small producer cooperative, all your members might already be in the room. But if it's a big consumer owned cooperative, you're holding events and you're drawing people in. And then, assuming you get enough members, you might not get enough members. It might turn out the steering committee thought they had a great idea and they go out in the world and everybody else is like, meh. And they're like, well, we tried. Right? But assuming this goes well, you then hold your first meeting. I've run out of room, so I'm just going to tell you. The co op holds its first meeting, they elect a board of directors, they vote on their bylaws. From there, they finish their capitalization. They've already raised some money through their member drive, because there's usually a cost to becoming a member. But if they need additional financing or loans, they go out and secure those. And this varies depending on the co-op, right? If they're gonna have a staff, they go out and they hire their staff. If they have some kind of building or location, they buy that or construct it or renovate it, and then they open for business. So, yes, woohoo! So, as far as resources go, let's look at this list of what you wanted to get out of it here. All right, I will continue to have individual conversations with all of you about your ideas for co-ops. Is the co-op structure for me? Hopefully you got some answers to that. We did not talk about why do co-ops fail. Uh, sometimes they fail for the same reason regular businesses fail. Maybe it wasn't a good idea. Maybe it was poorly managed. Uh, sometimes they fail because of the human element of it, if that democratic association part didn't go well. Um, a lot of times it has to do with conventional market forces. And I do hope you remember that slide I showed you about how they're more resilient than conventional businesses. There tends to be uh, this bias against it. Like, yeah. people are like, well, there was this one time that there was a co-op in my town and it closed. And it's like, do you remember all the other businesses that it closed to that weren't co-ops? <laughs> Laws and accounting rules, we got as far into that as we're gonna get for today. For profit or non-profit, hopefully I answered that question. It's a third way. Resources available. The main resources available in Montana, there are some national organizations, but within Montana, there are two cooperative development centers. I represent one. Janet came up and asked me early on, she's like, but wait, do you just work in Lake County? Because our name is Lake County Community Development. We have nothing to do with Lake County. We serve a much larger area than Lake County. The local government doesn't fund us at all. We're totally independent of them, and I can work with you if you're not in Lake County. So hopefully we wrap that up. Um, but we are a cooperative development center funded to work with folks who want to start cooperatives. And then Montana is really fortunate to have two cooperative development centers. There's a lot of states that don't have any. Um, and the other is the Montana Cooperative Development Center, located in Great Falls, run by Jan Brown. Um, they've worked with a few of you on the Montana Co-op Conversion and also on the Muscle Shell Investment Cooperative. Um, Jan is, is amazing and has done great work in a really short time at Montana Cooperative Development Center. So just kind of depending on where you are geographically um, and depending on what sort of sector you're in, you can work with either center, sort of depending on what makes sense. So, I have meant to leave a half an hour and I managed to leave all of nine minutes um, for this kind of co-op lab, co lab, co lab piece. You have a question. Um, the question was major constraints. One is definitely financial, and that that varies. Um, there's co-ops have this really neat advantage that they can raise this equity from their members, but that's also challenging. It's way easier to go to like one or two rich people and ask them for a lot of money than it is to go to a bunch of regular folks and ask them for go to a lot of them ask for small amounts of money. Lenders are also, as I said, sort of less willing to work with them. Um, but there are lenders specifically willing to work with co-ops, and co-ops do have some financial advantages. The other constraint, you mentioned regulatory, and I would say that isn't too big of an issue in Montana. We do have some pretty good incorporation statutes that would cover most types of cooperatives. So I think in Montana, we're in pretty good shape, unless you're doing something you know, like alcohol or hemp. Uh, that has other regulatory issues that have nothing to do with being a cooperative. Other constraints, time, right? Like people's willingness to actually engage in that, that whole process and, and building good pro group processes. Um, right off the top of my head, those are the, those are the key constraints. But, but what I'm thinking, when you talk about your child care cooperative, mm -hmm. which is a major crisis, but if yeah. you don't get, if you don't, uh, get, uh, get the kids vaccinated, for example, mm. So there's other regulatory things like that that prevent 
co-op and do what they would prefer to do. Right, yeah, so and that's why I was saying like a regulatory piece that's maybe not specific to a co-op, but it's just that larger regulatory world that we all deal with in all of our businesses. So, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the last handout, even though we don't have time to go through it completely. Um, but it gives you some brainstorming questions. Oh, Janet is going to help. Thank you, Janet. It gives you some brainstorming questions if you have an idea for a cooperative, or even if you don't, to start with, what is that need? And then think about, well, who are the people who have a stake in this? And it's really helpful. Here's my recommendation. Think about that specific problem you have. So I'll go back to my example of childcare, right? So of course, other parents of small children who work would be interested. But you know who else has a stake in that issue? Employers. Because it turns out it's really hard to get reliable employees if they don't have childcare, right? And so a lot of communities who are looking at addressing the childcare issue have started bringing the employers in and saying, hey, so a big issue here is making childcare affordable, right? Parents can't afford it and we're still paying terrible wages to the people who are running these things. They, the people who run them can barely make a living. And the employers say, well, it's actually in our interest to have good childcare. We'll help subsidize it, right? They might actually pony up money. Sometimes they pony up space, which is huge, right? It's a cost savings. So instead of actually just helping to pay for the cost, they help reduce what those costs are. And so that's also a really helpful way to think about cooperatives, is who are the other stakeholders that we should have involved in this conversation? Um, I want to, I mean, this is actually a great place to end. I haven't said anything yet today about multi-stakeholder cooperatives. I mentioned most cooperatives are owned by a, a certain type of a certain group, right? Producers, workers, consumers. There's also this model of multi-stakeholder cooperatives. Sometimes they're called hybrids, sometimes they're called solidarity cooperatives, um, because it is about providing solidarity and pe people working together. And so the idea is, you have a cooperative that's not just owned by one, it's owned by several of those groups. So an example would be the Central Co-op in Seattle. It's a grocery store cooperative. It was consumer owned. Recently they were like, you know what? Our workers are amazing. And our organization needs to have democratic governance for them as well. So they actually created a separate class of ownership. And that business is now 50% owned by its consumers who shop there and 50% by its workers. Now there's been a lot of naysaying of uh, multi-stakeholder and hybrid cooperatives that saying, oh, they're too complex, they're not gonna work. Because right, of course the employees wanna make as much money as they can. And the consumers want as good of a price as they can get. And so they're gonna have these competing interests and it's just not gonna work to have them all as owners. But I've heard some really compelling arguments from folks who say, you know what, that's the kind of thinking that has gotten us into this mess in the first place. We have these very complex problems, and if we want to solve them, we need complex solutions, and we need everybody at the table. Um, I've heard people say that they advocate that every cooperative should be a multi-stakeholder cooperative. Now, I will say that a lot of times when I first talk to people, um, and they're like, it's going to be multi-stakeholder, everybody's going to own it. Huh? How is that going to work? And it hasn't maybe been very well thought through, because you still have to kind of figure out how does that participation, how does the governance work, right? How are you divvying up power among these different groups? Um, how does that use part work? It's really easy to measure use if you're measuring how much everybody spends on groceries. But if you're measuring for some people how much they spend on groceries, and then for the workers you're measuring how many hours they work there, and then maybe you have a farmer component, and so you're measuring like how much they sell through the co-op, it gets a little more complex. So there are, there are complexities that have to be worked out there, but there may, there may be some value in this world of figuring out how do we solve for all of those things. How do we solve for this complex system where everybody is at the table, everybody has a say through that democratic association and that democratic governance, and everyone has a stake in the control and ownership. So there's a, there's a puzzle for us all to work on. Um, I do have cards. <laughs> I'm sorry we didn't get into the co-op the co kind of the co-op lab piece of it, but if you have an idea for a cooperative, make sure to talk to me this weekend and we'll we will continue that conversation beyond this workshop. All right, thank you all so much for your amazing.